Good morning, church family. We're live once again here in the sanctuary, and we just want to welcome you to our service today. Um, hope that you're doing well. We miss you very much, and we're hoping that we can be together here real soon again uh, to worship together. Uh, we've put together a couple songs today to start off the service, uh, some songs that are oldies but goodies, so uh, Jeff's here to sing them for you today. Oh, uh-huh. 
family. Um, I just want to say thanks for holding in there. Um, I, I know there's a lot of speculation right now of, of what's going to happen and, and we're still making those conversations and so patience and bear with us as we try to make the best decisions ultimately for your good and, and for your safety. Uh, but if you've been following along with us, you know that we've been in this series called morning, noon, and night for the last two weeks. Uh, this is week three, and you know, the first week we, we started out talking about this idea of the rhythms of a healthy soul. We talked about what it means to, to bear our souls before God morning, noon, and night. In week one, we looked at how our culture and the world around us can, is conditioning us in, in such a way that we're pulled in many different directions. Uh, there's distraction everywhere. And, and all of that is leading us to trouble and anxiety, which is the polar opposite of what God has called us to and what he wants from us. And so we establish this idea that if we don't change our direction, then in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, we're going to end up exactly where we're headed. And last week, we, we took the same idea and we took it a step further and we looked at uh, one of the first ways that we as people uh, can create rhythms of a healthy soul, and that was uh, the idea of Sabbath, the, the idea of rest, that, that God created rest as not just a rhythm for our lives, but a rhythm that he installed into the operating system of the world. And today, we, we, we turn to a rhythm that for many of us, we like to reject and to resist. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Mark chapter 1. When you get there, I want you to look at verse 9. But I want to say this, that I believe that what we're going to talk about today is a spiritual discipline. And, and this is definitely one of the disciplines that we don't like and, and that many of us want to reject. But it's something that's going to be important if we want to to get into a healthy, sustainable rhythm. So if you have Bibles and you're with me in Mark chapter one, verse nine says this, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And the voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son and with you, I am well pleased. Verse 12, the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan, and was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel, and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now here's a story, right? That Jesus shows up from Nazareth in Galilee to be baptized in the Jordan by John. And as he's being baptized, he's coming up out of the water, the skies split up. 
It's a mountaintop moment if there was one in Jesus' life. I mean, some of us, we, we have some great memories around our baptism, but not any that were that insane. I mean, here it is, that the skies are open and there's this audible voice of God. But then the story kind of takes a turn. And it says immediately, which is Mark's favorite word, that Jesus is ushered, literally led by the Spirit, out into the wilderness. A, a desolate place, no one around. Uh, it's, it's literally a desert. It says he was there for 40 days where he'd be tempted, that he was there with wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now, many of us, we have a problem with this passage. And part of it is, well, didn't Jesus teach us to pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one? So why does the Spirit immediately lead Jesus out into the wilderness? I mean, there isn't much here, right? Uh, this, this passage doesn't include the, the jumping off of the temple or, or the turning bread and, or stones into bread. But what is it about this passage. I mean, why, after the, the high moment of his baptism, does the Spirit immediately lead him into the wilderness? Uh, well, some of us have been conditioned to read this passage as a cage match, a, almost a Spartan-type challenge between Jesus and the devil. Uh, and Jesus is here to resist the devil and his schemes, to overcome temptation like the first Adam couldn't. I mean, leave it to, to Adam, literally the first man, to be placed into a garden where everything is perfect and life is just springing forward and flowing out of it, and he still fumbles and messes it up. And Jesus steps into uh, the anti-Eden, a, a wasteland, a desert, and, and does what the first Adam could. I think there's some truth to that. I mean, as Paul says, that so this death came through one man and sin came through Adam, so life comes through Jesus. And so, though there's some validity to this story, I, I think it all presupposes one fallacy. And that's the fallacy that Jesus hated the wilderness. That Jesus didn't want to be there in the first place. That this being led by the Spirit was something forceful and against his will. We can take that approach. Because many of us look at this story and we, we look at Jesus. And, and we, what we see in our mind as we read this, especially the other gospel accounts, is we see a weakened Jesus kind of withered up in the desert trying not to give in. And, and that's the problem. Is if we take that approach, because we're really we're cultured to believe that solitude and the wilderness and desolate places are evil things and nothing but temptation comes from there. But when we take that approach, we miss understand the rest of the Gospels. Mark 135 says, And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he, Jesus, departed and went out to a desolate place. And he prayed. When Jesus needed strength for the day and ministry, he went to the wilderness. He went to the desolate places. Matthew 14, 23 says, After he had dismissed the crowds, he went up onto the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. Jesus shows us that after a hard day's work, he wants nothing more than to go alone to pray to his Father. Luke 5, verse 16 says, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. I don't think that Jesus was led into the wilderness forcefully. I don't think that he was just led there for the temptation for, for some other purpose. Because when I look at this story, I, I see Jesus using the wilderness as a tactic and a strategy. What I mean by that is Jesus, after his baptism, knew ahead of him was 
three grueling years of ministry, of hard work, of people that would despise and reject him, and a course that would send him ultimately to his death. I believe that Jesus went into the wilderness because he knew he needed a time of preparation before the season of ministry. And I believe that if we're going to endure this life, to endure the callings that God has put on our lives, then we must learn to follow Jesus as he leads us into lonely and desolate places, not to punish us, but to prepare us, not to not for our not for evil, but for our good, and that we can learn to use the wilderness to pray. We can use solitude and silence to to grow in strength, to resist the devil, as the Bible says, and he will flee from us, because without it, we're we're like Adam, destined to fumble and fall. We're destined to repeat the curse, but if we ever want to have hope to reverse the curse, then we need to change our perspective of the wilderness from a punishment to a preparation. That we can use our time in lonely places, as Luke says, as a tactic and a strategy to resist the evil one. We must follow Jesus in this way. If we ever want to know what strength to defeat the enemy is like. But let's ask, why, why the wilderness? Why do we need to follow Jesus into the wilderness? And the reason why is simple, because it's quiet. The whole point of this series is what David said in the Psalms, is that he's learned to calm and quiet his souls. But we live in just a noisy and busy world. A writer, Jim Collins, said this. He said, we live in a cacophonous age, swarming insects and, tur and, and buzzing about emails, text messages, cable news, advertisements, cell phones, meetings, wireless web connections, social media posts. We run the risk of waking up at the end of the year having accomplished little of significance each year slipping by in a flurry of activity pointing nowhere. He went on to write that leaders can, indeed they must, be disciplined people who create time for disciplined thought and summon the strength for disciplined action. You know, I think there's a correlation between this quote and our Christian life. That in this cacophonous age, as he calls it, where we're constantly distracted, it would be easy for months and years to slip by where we accomplish little of significance for the kingdom of God. Where we see no lives changed by the gospel. We see, we see no baptisms, no healed relationships, no restored marriages, no brighter future for the next generation. And, and I want to say this, that maybe in the grand scheme of the universe, if, if some schmuck writes a book on leadership, teaching the value of finding quiet spaces for disciplined thought and to create disciplined action. And, and if our, our Savior, Jesus himself, showed us and modeled to us finding quiet, desolate places to be alone and to pray and to be with God, maybe we ought to take a page from that book. Maybe silence and solitude is refreshing because it centers us and sends us out in a focused direction. If you read the other gospel accounts of this trial scene, Jesus with the enemy, you see the way Jesus handles himself. In 40 days in the wilderness, we, we think of Jesus, like I said, um, withered up, crippled in a ball, and the devil comes, and he says, hey, take these stones and turn them into bread. And Jesus says, don't be foolish. Bread isn't sustaining. The word of God is sustaining. See, many of us don't employ a time of quiet often enough to know what the strength to resist the enemy is like. Many of us are overloaded with self. 
Uh, I know some people who can't sit still in a room and do something without noise in the background. But we, they can't work on a crossword puzzle without listening to the news. It's just noise to, to be heard, but not to actually understand what's going on. There, there's people I know that can't go to bed without ESPN playing in the background. Just softly in the background, not loud enough to understand the scores or the plays, but just loud enough to have something to play while they're trying to sleep. Uh, and, and even me, I, I sit alone in my office trying to write a sermon, and I'm constantly drawn to good things, like podcasts, listening to other church leaders. And even when I want to be alone in silence in my own office, I can hear the constant hum and buzz of the fan on my, com my computer. There is noise all around us. And we desperately need to find time to both be alone with God and to be quiet before him. So I believe that we should take up the mantle alongside Jesus and follow him out into desolate places for our good. And there are three ways I think we can do this. Uh, three easy and, and very practical ways. Uh, the first way is in motion. How did Jesus get from the area around the Jordan where he was baptized to the wilderness between Jerusalem and the Dead Sea? He walked. Uh, everybody in that time walked unless you rode on the back of an animal that either way the journey was significantly longer than it is for us in a car jesus spent 40 days walking around in the wilderness when we walk our speed of life slows down and did you know that the greatest example or the greatest metaphor for us and god is walking that the greatest metaphor in the Bible is walking with God. What I want to say is that when we walk, everything slows down. But as we walk, our bodies in motion, we breathe heavier, our arms move. Eugene Peterson, a pastor, once said this, the virtual elimination of walking by the automobile has more than physical consequences, for it diminishes also our spiritual perceptions. We get places faster, but we experience less. We need to find time to be with God alone and in solitude and in silence. Maybe for us that means just taking a walk around the house. We, we walk out the front door and we, we walk just around the house, not to do anything, not to find something to do with, with ourselves, but just to, to walk and to be in silence before God. And I also want to say this. One of the best ways that, that we can just practice this is to do it by walking. Uh, find time where you're not around somebody and just go for a walk. And, and I, I would say this as just a pro tip, if you have a cell phone, leave it at home. Lately, there's been many times where I've just left my cell phone laying around. I, I didn't mean to, and I know I didn't mean to because when I realized it was gone, I, I kind of get into a frantic. But as I, I've done this multiple times now, I've learned that while I'm on a walk without my phone, I'm okay. In fact, when I don't have my phone, my conversations are better. My perception of what's going on is better. And so though there are times where I'm terrified because I don't have my phone on me, things are actually really good. So the first way that we can practice this silence and solitude with God is in motion. The second way is in nature. When I was in college, I, I just loved to get out. And there was something about the, the mountains around the East Tennessee area that just made me enjoy it. 
It, and it didn't even have to be a long hike. It could just be a walk in the woods. There was something about feeling the warmth of the sun peeking through the trees that was just good for me. I, I, I would be alone and there, there would be no sound, no hustle of the world around me. Just the, the birds chirping and singing. Animals wrestling around in the woods. And I think there's something good about you know, before, even before God made woman, the first thing that Adam was charged with was naming the animals. And so here we have an example of Adam just in the garden, in nature, with God who made him and the animals that God had made. I think there's something good about that. And when we're out in nature, I think many of, for many of us, we understand when, what the psalmist means when he says, the, the earth and everything in it, the sun, the moon, and the stars, declare the praise of God. Jesus goes out into the wilderness, uh, the great outdoors, and he's with the animals. And I think as we follow that same direction, that it draws us into the beauty of God, the breathtaking splendor. And it brings us face to face with the inexpressible and immeasurable greatness of God. So we do so in motion, we do so in nature, and finally we do so in silence. The first thing I want to say is that I'm, I'm all for reading scripture. I, truly I am. But I also want to say this, as much as I believe that there are times for solitude and silence where we get alone with God and we read scripture and we pray through it, I think there's also something to being alone and silent with God, and that's it. We spend so much of our lives consuming, whether it's media, facts, information. I think there calls for a time to just stop consumption and just live in the presence of God. To meditate on his presence, what it means to be with God. And so I want to say this, that find time, whether daily or, or weekly, that, that you get alone with God and that's it. It's not alone with God to do something else. It's not alone with God to read scripture. It's not alone with God for X, Y, and Z. It's just alone with God in silence and solitude. And I think that's where it gets scary. There, a few years ago, a guy wrote a song. And, and the, the song was all about his car radio being stolen. And so many people have tried to make this song a metaphor, like the, the car radio being stolen is a metaphor for something else. And it really wasn't. The, the car radio being stolen was just that. It, literally, someone broke into his car and stole a radio out of his car. But the point of the song is that when you get into your car and you can't turn on the radio, you get to where you're going in silence. And the problem with it is silence is scary. When, when we're silent, there's nothing to hide behind. When we're silent, we can't avoid the, the thoughts in our own head. We can't avoid the evil in our own hearts. We can't hide behind the good things that we build up so others can see it and not see what we see. And when we're silent before God, we bear our whole selves before him, and he sees it all. When we sit in silence, I think that's where God does his best work. When we don't turn up the radio, when we turn the phones over, when we go for a walk and we can't hear anything except some birds and some animals scurrying, I think it changes our perception and it prepares us for what's ahead. And what I've learned is that we will never be able to change the battle. And as long as we live on this side of heaven and until Jesus returns and heaven invades the earth and the enemy's thrown out and vanquished forever, we'll never be able to rid ourselves of the battle between us and the enemy. 
But what I've learned is that we truly can change our battleground. That we don't have to battle from a place depleted, but we can battle from a place full of hope. I want to encourage us to find time for true quiet time. And not just a few minutes in the morning when we wake up as we drink our coffee, read a little devotional and a, a chapter of scripture. What I mean is I want us to find some real time where we can get quiet and alone with God. Let that change the way we do life. Let's pray this morning. Lord, we, we thank you for your goodness and your greatness. Lord, we pray that as we get alone and quiet with you, that you would reveal the things in our lives that keep us and hinder us from a life of fullness and a life of faithfulness. Lord, we pray that in those times you would show us just how great your presence is. Lord, thank you for Jesus, the best gift of all. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.